Minutes after war was declared on the 3rd of September 1939, air raid sirens went off in London. Those who brought up children during the war say it is a sound they have never forgotten. The siren went and we all rushed for gas masks and I felt complete and utter panic for my family and for myself, of course. The terrible part about the gas mask was the boys, my three elder sons, could put the ba a gas mask on themselves. But, uh, of course, the baby was very small and they gave you a, a, a great big contraption that you laid the child in. You know, it wasn't anything that you could just put over a baby's face. And then the all clear signal went and you just said, thank God, you know. Families prepared for the expected bombing raids, kitting out the Anderson shelters they'd built in their back gardens. Mothers in particular face an exhausting double burden. The disruption of everyday routines would be combined with a daily threat to the lives of their children. Government evacuation schemes meant that school children left their mothers, often for the first time, to travel to unknown destinations far from home. In all, a million and a half were moved from the big cities to the country. Women who had babies or preschool children were evacuated with them. We went to South Wales, me with Jimmy as a, a wee babe, and we ended up at this, this manor. It was out of this world. Gorgeous. The vastness of the place. You had to walk a quarter of a mile to get to the bathroom. <laughs> the manor itself, it was in like a, a forest. And it was the, the joy of putting Jimmy in the pram and going down this huge long draw, drive. Round and round and round it went. It was so beautiful down there, you know, walking, everything silent, not meeting a soul. Perhaps you might see a fox run across the field. There was no houses or anything around there till you got into Lampeter. It was really lovely. Just walk in the lanes. In towns where the children were not evacuated, life continued much as before. Then came the first real sign that war was on. The dread moment when fathers were called up for military service. I was already a family man, you see. It wouldn't have been so bad, I'd uh, sort of not held my family in the great esteem that I did. Every night, my wife was on the bath. When it was ready, she called down. Come up, Daddy, the bath's ready. No one was waiting. So I'd go up, splash it a time or two, and that croon of the tune. Swing me in the moonlight, in the moonlight tonight. Swing high, swing low, swing me over the apple tree, Joe. Don't stop for a spoon, dear, there's a bright light overhead. I'll pay you, Joe, the kisses I owe when the moon has gone to bed. Then kiss her. Lift her up, towel her off, and put her into bed. And our first experience of the army is to receive a whole lot of kit and a perfectly beautiful haircut. And after that, they make friends with the sergeant major. But I'm afraid it's quite impossible for me to repeat what he said to them. I thought, well, I'd never see my wife again, or family. I felt rotten about it. If I'd have had the guts to, to not go, I, I wouldn't have gone, but I didn't have the, no, I didn't have the guts. There'll be... My husband went away when Valerie was not quite three weeks old. He went into the Navy and he didn't come back for three and a half years. 
in which time he travelled all over the world. And of course, Valerie grew up. So she had photos of him and she would, when she started talking, she would jabber away to him. And she said to me one day, Daddy doesn't talk, does he? So I said, well, Daddy does, but the photo doesn't. So this photo really was her daddy in her mind. For the mothers who'd been evacuated with their children, the attractions of life in the countryside were starting to wear thin. Despite the reassuring images in government films and the fun that some of the children no doubt had, it was no holiday for the women. Many had started to miss their homes in the city and living with other evacuee mothers, often in overcrowded conditions, led to strain and conflict. They used to swear at their children, call them all terrible names, B's and F's and all that. And I heard one say, look, look at that B there. But she said the full word. She said she dresses him four times a day. She won't let him have a wet nappy on him. So I came in the room, I said, all right. I said, which one is the bastard now? She said, yours, look at it. So uh, I said, well, what's the matter with him? She said, you're going to change him again? I said, yes. I said, I'm going out this afternoon. I said, I'm going to put a new set, clean set of clothes on him. So she said, you want to put him in an effing glass case? So I said, all right, now, which one called him a bastard? And this girl came straight up to me and she says, I did. What are you going to do about it? Well, I'm afraid I went into her like, well, nobody's business and it took the butler, the gardener, and the chauffeur to pull me away from her. And I just sent a telegram home to Jim that uh, I was coming home. Would he meet me at the station? In fact, most of the evacuated mothers and children returned home. Some to be reunited with husbands who had not yet been called up, or who were in reserved occupations. The expected air attacks on London had still not occurred, and it seemed safe but not for long. I'd done a foolish thing, really, coming back, and yet, to me, it wasn't foolish. I was back with Jim and I was back with the baby, so we was a little family for a little while, that's all. Even if it was only for a couple of hours of a night time, we was a little family before the sirens went. In September 1940, the Blitz began. London was the main target where there were sustained bombing raids for over several months. Parents and children were forced to take refuge in mass air raid shelters. They were totally unprepared for the horror of saturation bombing. Terrible bang, and our shelter really literally shook, absolutely shook. And everybody was in a panic. And as they were rushing around, everybody was what, falling over, and they're pushing each other. And all the dust started, concrete dust, all started rising up. and. Um, Derek was in this bath on the floor. Of course, he started choking. So we had to pick him out there quick. We were terribly frightened. And of course, the baby was screaming the whole time. Couldn't pacify him, not for a long, long time. When we had the rains, we had guns on the common and the shells used to come over the house if they were firing our way. But when it was very bad, they used to have two naval guns. Well, they probably had more, but there were two that sounded entirely differently. And they used to come along the roads and fire. And they were very, very noisy because they were outside your house when they fired. And the letterbox used to rattle, and very often the knocker, which was a, a thick, heavy knocker, that would knock as well. So they would say, what is that? So I used to say to Valerie, that is popping Penelope. And then there was another one. They have both had different sounds, and that one we called Keyhole Kate. And I used to say to them, that's Keyhole Kate, and that's one of Daddy's guns, because they were naval guns. And she used to say, is Daddy there, to begin with? And I'd say, no, but they're guns off his ship. And she'd say, is our popping Penelope and Keyhole Kate coming tonight? And she really felt that when they were there, she was safer. Night 
Night after night, the bombing raids continued, and the Blitz spread to other major towns and cities all over Britain. You always look for night time because you knew it was night time which was the worst. And sometimes you didn't even get to the shelter before you could hear the bombs, the thuds around, and you knew then that you'd, that you'd got to get there. I won't say I didn't feel afraid, I was afraid. But all I wanted to do was survive with my baby. She was the most precious thing to me. That's all I wanted to do was survive with her. As long as you, you could get to the shelter then, you felt safe. And you sit there with your baby and you wait. Then you hear these thuds all that's what used to get thuds. When, it, when a bomb dropped, you, were, you had the thud. Now, you never hear the one that hits you, but this particular one, we did hear it screaming down. And when it hit, the whole shelter rocked. Remember, we're in the earth, but it absolutely moved the earth. And, and, then after, after it's dropped, then comes the blast. And, and the blast is like a big, big thing sweeping over you then. I never dreamt that I'd get killed, nor our Sylvia, nor my baby. I just lived for her and to survive with her. That was the only thing that, from day to day and from night to night, that was the only thing that I lived for. In the first three months of the Blitz, 25,000 people were killed and around 140,000 injured. The horror of the death and destruction in the Blitz cities created an atmosphere of increasing panic. I was so frightened I just wanted to get away from Bristol. Being pregnant, that made me worse. So I used to get my husband or, or my mother or anybody to come with me and we, we just walked and walked and walked until I uh, felt that there was a safe place to stop. And we would, we would stay there all night in the cold and the damp. We didn't get much sleep at all because it's not, not, very, um, not very comfortable. We used to sleep on anything. We sleep on hay or in an old barn or under a hedge in open fields, but um, I didn't care. As long as I was out of the city, I didn't care. I didn't really care where I was. It affected me so much that I went to premature labor, uh, and I was, I was taken to the nearest hospital at the time, which was happened to be the poor law institution. Uh, and uh, the birth was so, uh, so difficult that I lost the, I've lost the baby. Um, and I was, I was just heartbroken. I, I just didn't want to live after that. At the time, it was not admitted officially that thousands of families trekked out of the cities every evening to find somewhere safe away from the bombs. They went to mines, to railway tunnels, and even to caves. I said, now where we're going, I said, it'd be cold. I said, and damp. I said, but I'll wrap you up in blankets and you'll be safe. That's all I want. I said, you'll be in safe. No, oh, the bombs won't touch us, Mum, will they? No. I said, they won't, not where we're going. Every night, round about five-ish, I used to get all the children dressed and packed up in warm clothes and, uh, and our bed clothes we had to take down there and you were one of hundreds, or one family of hundreds of families making their way into the caves. And uh, that was, for me, the frightening point. I felt as if, surely to goodness, it can't take all these people. When I first got to those caves, I dreaded going in. I felt they were falling in on me. And I was really terrified every time I went down there, though I went for the sake of the children. It reminded me of going in inside a cemetery, really. And I used to have the feeling that that's what we were doing, you know. I had some awful feeling sometimes. Had I been on my own, I wouldn't have gone down there, because I couldn't have stuck it. 
the first time I went there, I felt as if, gosh, I can't stand it. I don't think I can stand it. We were a long way into the caves, which was a horrid feeling, really. If I could have been nearer to the door, I think I would have felt happier about it. We went inside and there was all this water running down the walls of the rocks. And I said, oh, gosh, I said, we won't be very comfortable in here. So I thought, I put up the deck chairs for the children and I had the blankets, what we could manage. We took in carriers and things to take and I wrapped it all round them. And uh, they wore their coats. They didn't take their clothes off, they wore their coats. And uh, I seen them settled down for the night. So uh, we got to go to school. I said, yes, you've got to go to school. <gasps> they said, Mum, after we've been sleeping up here all night? I said, yes. So anyway, I thought, so, well, they're safe here. And um, I shall have to stick the cold myself for as long as I can. But I, I, as I said, I stayed there a month and I couldn't stand no longer because it was terrible there, you know, cold. It was so cold. The blitz on most British cities ended in the summer of 1941. But this wasn't the end of the difficulties facing mothers. There had been rationing since the outbreak of the war, but the increasing shortages of food and raw materials made shopping and feeding the family more and more of a struggle. Do you like standing in a queue for your vegetables? Or do you think it's tiring and a waste of valuable time? Do you ever find your long wait has been useless, that supplies of what you want have run out before your turn comes? It's not the greengrocer's fault, it's up to you. Dig for victory. Families were encouraged to spend their spare time growing vegetables to ease the food shortage on the home front. The diet of parents and children began to change with far less meat being eaten than in peacetime. Middle-class mothers like Mary Cole were forced to prepare and cook meat they would never have dreamt of eating before the war. People used to think that it would be terrible to pull a rabbit to pieces because they are nice, fluffy little things and you think, oh, aren't they pretty? But when you're short of food uh, and when you've seen people blown to pieces and bits and pieces of them, a rabbit then becomes... You know, you lose all your softness towards rabbits. You dipped it in flour and seasoned flour and, and fried it slightly to sort of start it cooking before you put it in the oven and put it in with lots of vegetables and um, they have got a meal that lasted you literally all week for two of you. Women were called up to work in essential industries, and by 1943, even mothers with small children were strongly encouraged to join the war effort. For some, it was what they'd always wanted. I loved my work, and I really wanted to work, and I was very, very happy that I had the opportunity to work. It was release for me. I felt very, very constricted and confined in a house with, with two children. And um, it gave me freedom. It gave me money, my own money. I didn't have to go cap in hand to my husband for extra money. And uh, also, I wasn't so dominated by anybody. I, I was able to make my own decisions and uh, you know, carry them out myself within the limitations of the war. In Britain, there are three million children under five, and a vast number of them belong to mothers who have been caught up in the war effort. There weren't enough nursery schools and nurseries to cope even with peacetime needs. So what on earth is happening now? 
Nurseries were provided by the government all over Britain. It was an astonishing turnabout. Just a few years before, married women had been legally barred from working. There was often good quality care by trained staff and many nurseries were open all day for mothers on shift work. The nursery was very well run, very clean. The, the, the children had good food, but it was really an expedition to get them there and to get them back in the evening, you know, where I used to have to push them in the push chair up to the shop, up to the main road, the Stratford Road, and then catch the Midland Red bus, and a quarter of an hour on the bus, and then get off the bus, and then walk to the nursery, put them in the nursery, and then get on my bicycle and go to work. And of course, that, that all had to be repeated in the evening. Come here, Violet. Come and have your scarf put on. Hey, don't do that. Well, you'd be short-tempered if you had to be at work by 8 o'clock in the morning and get the kid ready to go out too into the bargain. In some towns, there was inadequate nursery provision and mothers were forced to leave their children at overcrowded childminders' homes. It was hard to face a long day's work in a munitions factory knowing that your child wasn't happy. I could hear her right down the road, uh, whatever I was going, and she was, she was going, Mummy, Mummy, Mummy. And I was going to work like that, sickened, you know, every day, coming home at night and knowing that she'd been crying all day nearly. And on the morning, no, I don't want to go, no, not go. I said, you have to do, love, because your mummy's got to go to work. It was hard work because... Uh, you to be up early at six o'clock in the morning and you were coming home at half past five and six o'clock at night and uh, then you had to cook and clean and wash and iron and everything then before you went to bed sometimes i didn't know they were getting into bed or, or getting out of bed for work i was that tired you know propaganda newsreels presented an upbeat image of women at work but the hours were long and the work arduous, and women with children had the added burden of running a home. The legend of the war effort has obscured the fact of widespread absenteeism amongst mothers. On uh, one or two occasions, I used to wake up in the morning and get Jimmy ready, and, and I thought, oh, to hell with it. I'm not going to work today. I feel too tired. And I used to undressed Jimmy again, put him back in his... He was still half asleep anyway. Put him back in his cot, get back into bed myself, and that was it. And uh, on two occasions when I'd done that, they sent... One of the foremen came round. Why aren't you at work? And I said, well, I just don't feel too well today. Uh, well, will you be all right to come in and do some evening work tonight? I says, no. I said, no, I said, I don't want to come in tonight and do any work. And then the next time when I had a day off, they asked me again to do evening work, because the work was 24 hours there then. I said, no, I said, I'm not coming in to... He said, you know you're going to lose your job. I said, and then I said, I couldn't care less. I said, I'll lose the job. I said, because I'm too tired to do it anymore. I said, not only me, I said, there's the others in there. I said, they, they have days off because they're too tired to work. homecoming of a British soldier. This is the kind of news for which every woman waits. It's the end of separation, the beginning of that ecstatic reunion of husband and wife still very much in love. The propaganda presented home leave as a romantic interlude and a great morale boost, particularly for the mother and her children. yet to know a world of peace are waiting to welcome the daddy they can't remember. Of course, the reunion was welcome, but it was often awkward and even something of an anticlimax. I cooked him a breakfast, and it was egg and bacon, which was very scarce. And we, was, we were so busy talking about everything, I kept saying, Jim, your egg's getting cold. 
and it did get cold and it never got eaten and I must admit I thought oh what a waste of an egg. <laughs> From the word go, they got on very well together and Valerie followed him around like a little puppy dog. And she couldn't understand why she couldn't go into the toilet with him and the bathroom with him and everywhere with him. She just followed him, as I say, like a little dog. And they got on very well, really, but most fathers, when they came home, there was a certain amount of jealousy and it was mostly the fathers who resented, not outwardly, but you could feel that they resented the amount of attention that the child was taking. Yes, this is one of those brief interludes when sanity returns to the world. When human beings know that real happiness is not bought, but comes to those who seek it. For some men, the reunion was so overpowering, they did not want to return to the fighting. If, if I'd have had the guts to desert, I probably would have deserted, but I'd have always been on the run, wouldn't I? Especially having a good life at home, for, like we had, you know. For that four weeks I was at home. It was a big temptation not to go back. Most of the time, letters were the only link between fathers at the front and their families back home. The long years of separation caused many marriages to break up. It was only through letters that fathers could maintain any real sense of their relationship with their children and their wives. I used to write to Jim every day. I had to because Writing to him, it was so I was talking to him. I used to write as I, I would talk to him, so I would write and let him know how Jimmy was going on and things like that. And with Jim, well, my letters I used to get from my poor old Jim. I can quote them. My dearest Flo, I'm all right. Hope you're all right. Keep your chin up. See you soon. Love you always. Love to Jimmy. Jim. The one and the main lifeline that we had was receiving mail from home. And uh, these were red letter days. It sounds like a pun, that, don't it? Red letter days. They were, really were. And they really lifted everybody in the unit because nearly everybody got mail. And especially me, I was very nick nick close to my family. And it was a very emotional time when one received your mail. I not only just got one, many a time I got two letters, one from Norma and one from Hetty. And as I said before, these times were very emotional. It brought memories back and you thought, I wonder if I will see them again. We were in Kent and we were in what's known as Doodle Bomb Alley. And I still remember the first Doodle Bomb coming over because I wrote to my husband in France saying, most extraordinary thing, I saw an aeroplane on fire fly over. I think that was one of the very first. And then they came over in great quantities and the Spitfires went up to fight them down and the anti-aircraft guns round had a go at them and the noise was terrific and nobody could sleep. It was mostly at night somehow. And the children were nervous and a bit frightened and we gathered in the passage, which we thought was the safest spot in the house, the downstairs passage, and in order in order to cheer ourselves up, we would sing all together as loudly as we could, I'll cut off your head, Mr. Doodlebomb, I'll cut off your head, Mr. Doodlebomb. And this was had a wonderful effect. And because we concentrated on the singing of this song, we then tended, as a group, to forget the row that was going on and the danger. And they really enjoyed that, and they sang that very lustily. In the summer of 1944, War-weary families in London and the South East had to face a final terror, attack by doodlebugs. Small, pilotless planes directed towards the capital, which cut out and exploded on impact.
they again brought death and destruction to those living in their path. This particular night, uh, we, we had had the bombing very, very strong. And then there was a lull, beginning in the morning. So I said to my neighbours, I'll go in and make a cup of tea, as, as the shelter was right outside where I live. And I just got the kettle on when my son, Derek, who was nearly nine, came in and said, Mummy, there's another one coming over. So I said, right, you go in and lay on the bunk and I'll come straight in there. So I took baby in my arms and I rushed in there. Of course, you heard it stop. When it stopped, you knew something was going to happen. And of course, crash. Shelter just collapsed on top of us all. So I was screaming naturally, and I got the baby in my arms and I just bent over. Derek was in a bunk and all my neighbors, all the screaming was going on. And I just thought, oh, help me, please God help me, get me out. And then I could hear noises above where people were trying to rescue. And I'm shouting, please get me out. And I managed, to, to push my hand through where they'd moved all the rubble and got my hand out and they were holding my hand saying, hang on lady, hang on lady. And then they pulled, I said, I've got a baby in my arms. And they pulled the baby out and then they pulled me out and uh, put me in an ambulance. I said, there's a lot more in there. My little boy's in there. But then they took us to hospital. They put me into a bed, tended to my wounds. I had a double fractured leg and chip bone in the spine. They told me then that Derek had been killed. I felt the end of the world had come, really. I broke my heart. Oh, yes, I broke my heart. Yeah. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't be off that. No. I think that is the only relief, if you cry, is the relief it gives you. But um, even now, even now, all those years, all those years ago, I still think of him. He'll never be out of my mind, and I'll never, ever, ever forget the incident. The only way I would forget it is if I lose my memory. It'll live with me for the rest of my life. I mean that, for the rest of my life. The war in Europe ended in May 1945. At last there was an end to the bombing and the threat to the lives of children. Those fathers who had survived the war came home. They saw for the first time the effects of the Blitz. But the damage wasn't just to buildings and blast victims. As the joyful reunions began in earnest, the longer term psychological and emotional effects of being a parent in wartime became apparent. First of all, it started with very bad headaches. My head used to get like two hammers and I used to feel like it, it was going to burst. And then I got that I couldn't sleep and I wouldn't go out. I wouldn't take the children out. I used to imagine that there was things coming through the wall and people were talking about me in the street. Obviously they weren't, but I used to... That's how my imagination got, because I couldn't sleep. All I wanted to do was sleep. I got that feeling that I was going to die, but I didn't want to die alone. So whenever I wanted to go from one room to the other, I used to take Jimmy with me, even if it was from the living room to the kitchen. And I even done it when my husband came home when they had uh, stationed him at Woolwich. I used to say, I want to go into the other room. I used to make him come with me because I had this terrible fear that I was going to die and I didn't want to die alone. It was a terrible feeling. And as I say, that if Jimmy and I was on our own or if I knew I had to go out shopping and Jimmy says, I stopped with Raymond. I said, no, you'll come with Mummy. This particular night, I put the children to bed 
I put the cushion in the gas oven, all ready to turn the gas on. And just at that precise moment, my neighbour came in. And he took one look and he said, right, we get the doctor. Well, they got the doctor, which I don't remember much about. But I do remember that they took the children away and they took me to the mental hospital. All manner of feelings, you're all boiled up inside. And I said to myself, is it only me that feels like this? Or is it other people? Are other mothers feeling the same as I am? I used to just pass out, right out. And Jim used to go and get a cushion and put it underneath my head, then go to my next door neighbour and say, Auntie Kath, Mum's asleep on the floor again. And my neighbours used to come in and look after me. They knew what to do, you know, just to wet me for it or whatever they used to do. And I used to come round, they used to make me a cup of tea. And uh, sometimes I used to say, come on, Jimmy, come in with us. I said, no, no, leave Jimmy here. Don't take him in with you. I know that it happened, all this happened, because of what I went through through the war and I suppressed it all and the fear which was wrapped up inside, it had got to have a release, it had got to come out some way or another. And that's the way that it came out. It nearly sent me mad. It's well known that families had to contend with shortages of basic foods until rationing finally ended in 1953. But the less visible and less recognised consequences of war, the nightmares and depression, continued even longer. Mothers had paid a high price for trying to keep their children safe and their families together during the war years. <laughs> 